Thank you, Kim. You know, normally I would just transition into me talking a whole bunch, but I don't have to today. Uh, I'm so excited to have a young man joining us to, to bring the word. His name is Evan Adams. Uh, so uh, we are just super excited to, to give an opportunity to a young man who hasn't had a lot of experience preaching. So we would love to give a, a warm Zion welcome to Evan as he brings the word today. Testing. There we go. There we go. What's going on, guys? Um, before I do anything, I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to be here at Zion Church. As Pastor Eli said, my name is Evan Adams. I'm a leadership development resident over at Crossroads Evangelical Church here in Wauseon. And my role on staff is essentially to get built up and poured into and, and trained up by those who have many years of experience and wisdom to give and to explore different areas of ministry and hopefully to clarify God's calling of ministry on my life. Um, I just arrived here at, Wa at Crossroads and in Wauseon at the beginning of this year in January. And over the past few months, it's been a great privilege of mine to get to know your guys as pastor, Pastor Eli. So I want to thank you directly, Pastor Eli, for inviting me to share God's word with your church today. Um, I'm grateful to you. But as we read on the screen, we're going to be in Luke chapter 8, a familiar passage, you know, the, the disciples and Jesus are in a boat, and there's panic, and Jesus calms a storm. But I want to share with you, brothers and sisters in Christ, before we start, I just want to be real. Um, I'm kind of like the disciples in the boat. Um, I gave a little bit about my job, but you guys are probably thinking, like, who's this dude? I don't know him. A um, little bit about me, where I am now, where God has brought me today is very different from what my original context was um, I'm not from here. I was brought up in a city just south, of, uh, just south of Detroit. I didn't plan on this, but actually my family came here. They drove all the way an hour and a half to, to be here with us. Would you guys give them a round of applause for me real quick? They're, 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 they're really awesome and the most special people in the world to me, and they deserve to be celebrated. But back to the sermon. So I love the city, right? So being in the farmland and the rural and, and the country is very, very new to me. Um, another thing about me is I'm relatively new to the faith. I've, I've been following Jesus for just roughly four years, and I was not raised in the church, nor was I raised in a ministry culture. And me landing here in Wauseon is just a result of me trying to pursue the calling of ministry God has put on my heart. And I'm just trying my best to be faithful to that call. Um, so similar to the disciples, God has kind of flipped my life upside down from what it was, and I'm learning new stuff every day. But... Enough about me. Let's dig into the text. As, I, as we read, we're going to be in Luke 8, verses 22 through 25, if you have a Bible. If not, that's totally okay. The verses will be on screen. Um, the text reads, One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. And so they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water? And they obey him. You guys pray with me real quick before we start. Lord, thanks for today. Thanks for Zion Church, Lord. Um, it's a privilege to be here and meet all these new people. Lord, you have a specific message you want to speak to each and every individual here. So I pray that your spirit would do that. I pray that I would hide behind you as you speak and, and will trust you to do this, God, because you are faithful to do so. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I titled my sermon for today, Why God? Um, and the tone of the person uttering this title is, is more like, like, why God? Why do the difficult things that happen on this earth? earth happen? Why am, I why am I personally going through the difficult situations I'm going through? Why, God? The tone of the person making this utterance is almost in frustration with God. And I title my message this way because I think it's a difficult question we all come to at certain moments of life when, when darkness shows its face in our lives, we get some type of really bad news, or, or maybe just the difficulty of life seems too heavy to carry, and we question God, why would you let this happen to me? 
And as we look into this narrative of Jesus and the disciples, I think we can get a peek into God's heart for us as we go through difficult times in our lives. So the action in this narrative starts when Jesus and the disciples hit a severe storm. But how did, how did they get into this storm? Let's see what the text says. In verse 22 and 23, it says that Jesus said to them, Let us go to the other side of the lake. And so they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake. I'm not trying to reveal some hidden, sneaky piece of information or nothing like that. The simple text that this, or the simple truth that this text reveals is that Jesus sent them into the storm. We know the character of God. We know he knows all things from the moment he spoke the world into existence until the very last day. He knows everything that's ever going to happen before it happens. And one thing we want to do when we approach this text and we see that Jesus is the one who sent them into the storm is we want to overlook it. But Jesus sent them into this storm knowing, that they, knowing what they were about to go through, and this is something we have to wrestle with. And the same thing may be true in your life right now as well. And oh, how quick we are to question our Creator when trouble comes. We actually get bold enough to think, God, you had it together up to this point. But now that this type of turmoil, this difficulty has come, you've lost control, God. You messed up the plan. Not recognizing the fact that this is the exact plan that God penned for us when he sat down and wrote out the story of our lives. Jesus allowed the disciples to go through this storm, and he has likely allowed you to go through, your, through a storm in your life as well. Jesus is too good of a shepherd to let us go through life without any bumps or bruises, because he knows the easier this life is, the less we're, lo we're to look like him, probably. But I want to take a quick pause to make some really important clarifications. I want to be really clear here and direct. If you are surrendered to Christ, if you are in Christ, difficulties you go through are never a punishment for sin. We know this to be true because every sin you ever committed in your past and everything you, every sin you will ever commit in your future was paid for by the blood of Jesus on the cross. You are completely washed clean, completely free from this payment. There is no gray area here. That's the first clarification. The second thing I want to clarify is, am I suggesting to you that Every storm you've ever been through is something you just kind of like worked and orchestrated and sent your way? No. We live in a fallen and sinful world, and the pain we experience is often a result of living in a fallen and sinful world. And being amongst the sinful people and us being sinful people ourselves. And there are genuinely things that God never wanted for you. As you weep over the pain you've experienced, God weeps alongside you. His heart breaks at some of the things that we have to experience in life. In life. But one thing I am suggesting to you is that there are times where God will allow you to go through a storm with a specific and divine purpose behind it that you may not understand in the moment. He allows this to happen. What comfort is there in this, though? Let's look back to the verse I think is really important as we dissect this text together. At the very beginning of the narrative where anything happens, what does it say? Verse 22 says, one day Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. And so they set out. You're like, what the heck, Evan? That's like the most mundane text in the world. How is that an encouragement at all? The encouragement, this is an encouragement because Jesus went with them into the storm. The text does not say that Jesus stopped, was on the shore and he said, you guys do your thing, get in a boat. It doesn't say that Jesus said, you guys go, start sailing to the other side of the lake and I'll meet you over there. It doesn't say that. What does it say? It says, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across the other side of the lake. And so they set out. They did this together. Jesus went with the disciples into the storm, and he is with you in your storm. There's not one single thing Jesus is ever going to allow you to go through that he won't be experiencing with you right at your side, walking in it. See, growing up and for pretty much the first 19 years of my life, football was my whole world, my everything. My deepest joy in life came from strapping on pads and banging helmets with my teammates. And one of the parts I absolutely hated, I know it's a strong word and I need to use that word, hated about football was the conditioning. We had to run and try to get in shape. And I once had a coach back when I was 12, 13 years old. He actually coached my brother as well when we were playing Little League ball named Rob Merla. Um, to this day, he's the favorite coach I've ever had, but he also worked us way harder than any coach I ever have as well. We would run miles a day. We'd run long distances, short distances. You name it, we would do all types of ridiculous things trying to get in shape. Puking during conditioning was not a rare occasion being coached by Coach Rob. 
But at the end of every practice, me and the guys would be moaning and complaining as Coach Rob came up to us, and he was like, he was like, all right, guys, for conditioning, we're going to do, we got this many sprints, and then we got this many burpees, or whatever the exercise was. There was all kinds of them. Then we got two-mile run or whatever to finish it off, or whatever the conditioning was for that day. But you see, we all had a deep admiration and respect for Rob. Because every single time he would tell us what our conditioning was for that day, he did it with us. He would give us our conditioning for the day, and he would lead us, saying, come on, guys. I'm with you. And see, guys, what I, what I want us to see in this text is that this is what the character of our God is like. God sees darkness coming your way. He sees what you're going through. And he looks, he looks you deeply in your eye, and he steps closer to you. He says, come on. Let's go. You're not alone. I'm right next to you. We know this to be true because of what God has promised us in Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Or Psalm 34, 18 that says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those crushed in spirit. May we cling to these truths. God does not watch from the heavens as you suffer. He steps into it with you. So we've established two things. One, that Jesus will sometimes allow us to go through a storm with a specific purpose in mind. And two, he will always be with us as we go through suffering. We will never be in it alone. But we still haven't discovered the why of this narrative. Why did Jesus allow the disciples to go into this storm? Let's look back into the text. I want to make it a habit, a habit of that. Remember what happened thus far. We, the disciples and Jesus are in a boat, and they, the storm comes. The disciples are freaking out while Jesus is snoozing. And, he, and the, it literally says that the disciples are in danger, right? And verse 24 continues in the narrative, and it says, and they went and woke Jesus, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. And they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water? And they obey him. See, the clear heart problem that the disciples had, that Jesus exposes with the words he says to them, is their faith. This is clear in their response to Jesus, right? It says in verse 25 that they marveled at him displaying this type of power. To, to marvel is to be surprised or shocked at something. A person only marvels at something if what just ha they didn't think that what just happened was originally possible. And the disciples watched Jesus do something as authoritative and powerful as command a storm to be still, and it obeys. And they're baffled. They marvel because they didn't think Jesus had that much power. And they walk away saying, Holy smokes, this, he really is that guy. Jesus did something that the disciples didn't think he was capable of doing. Their faith in him was increased by watching him exercise this type of power. And this is the why of the narrative we've been looking for. Jesus knew the disciples were going to be going through a lot more difficult things than a storm in a boat. They were going to be preaching his gospel, doing miracles, healing people, casting out demons. I mean, for God's sakes, the disciples did the foundational work upon which our faith stands today. And he knew, he knew if they're going to be going through all these challenging and awesome things, this work I'm giving them of preaching my gospel, expanding my kingdom, and going through the inevitable difficult things and trials that will come with this work, they must be deeply rooted in trusting in who I am. It's the only thing that will get them through. Being deeply rooted in Jesus. And brothers and sisters in Christ, the same is true of you. As the weight of life comes crashing down, the only foundation that is sustainable to carry the weight of your life and mine and hold us up is being firmly planted and trusting in him. And you're probably thinking, Evan, I've heard so many people preach on suffering and pain and storms. And you're like, I've heard this text a hundred times alone. But there's something I think is really important that God put on my heart that I think he wants us to see. I, I want you to take a step back and think of like a period of three, four months in your life where there was just minimal conflict, it was extremely peaceful, and, or maybe it was longer, six months, a year, whatever it is. And when you just look back and you're like, ah, I miss those days. I wish I could just go back just for a minute. The thing that I think God wants us to see is that it is likely that your faith grew less in that period than 30 minutes spent in this boat would with, your, with the disciples and Jesus. There was something monumental about this 
experience of hardship the disciples had with Jesus that simply wouldn't have been accomplished if the disciples were comfortable. The point I'm making is that there is something uniquely edifying and faith-building about suffering. And as I'm nearing the end of this word, I want to address something really, really hard. There are some serious atrocities and horrible evil that happen here on earth. People get murdered, raped, children die, wives and children get abused, you name it, fill in the rest. Some of us have experienced these things sitting here today. Horrible things that happen. And I feel like I'd be doing a disservice not to address how severe the evil gets here on our fallen planet. And for whatever, you, for whatever you have been through personally, I'm truly sorry. And there's so many brothers and sisters in Christ who would love to walk with you in your pain. I, I want to be really, really clear. I'm not trying to minimize your pain. Whether it happened recently or 20 years ago, your pain is valid. I want to be really clear. Your pain is valid. But if you think what you've been through is too horrible to be redeemed... For God to work it to, to good? Look at the cross. Ask Mary, the mother of Jesus, who watched her son get brutally whipped, murdered, scourged, spit on for several hours on end. Ask her if she thought her pain was redeemable. Yet from her pain, one of the most horrific crimes that's ever been committed from her pain was God opening the door to bring through his redemptive plan to bring salvation to the whole world. From her pain was actually how you and I are able to sit here today and worship Jesus together. This is how good the God we serve is to take something that ugly and work it into something that beautiful. To literally bring salvation to the world from something that ugly. And I'd be darned if I didn't take this opportunity as I stand here today with you, Zion Church, to extend inv this invitation I don't know most of you, but if you're not in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and, and you understand that you are sinful and in need of a Savior, you trust He is God and did die to pay for your price for sin, then rose three days later conquering that sin and He lives today. If you believe this and you wish to step into personal relationship with Jesus, your Creator, do it. Please come pray with someone you trust who's here today. I'm sure there's more than one of the saints who would love to to pray with you today, or, or with Pastor Eli, I know he would love to pray with you, or come see me, I'd love to pray with you. Let today be the day you decide to be in a loving relationship with the God who created you. So with everything we've talked about today, what do we do with this information? As we move to the part of like, how do we apply this information to our lives? I only have two things I want us to think about. We're going to get through these quick. At the beginning of our time together, we were asking the question, why God? And my challenge to you is, I want us to think differently when things get hard. See, Jackie Hill Perry said in a book that I'm actually reading by her right now, hear this, it's so good, it's going to be on the screen. It says, suffering creates an interpretive lens of God, either refining the sufferer's vision of God or blurring it. See, bad circumstances tempt us to doubt something true about God, that he isn't good or kind or faithful or trustworthy or present, or powerful, or just, or real even. The trial becomes a false teacher to whom we listen because, if we're honest, believing a lie is more comfortable than reality. Hope is an uncomfortable project, but to this we are called. In other words, church family, we can continue to let our circumstances make us question God and his goodness. We can remember who he is, and draw near to him when difficulty comes. This is my first application I want to challenge you with. Application number one. Instead of asking why, remember who he is. It's so funny how evil works in our lives. Man, it, man is it deceptive. See, Satan will step in the door of our lives and, and he'll start working up some chaos, some evil, some distress, some pain, some storm. And, and then he'll get in our, and sometimes we even participate with him in that evil, unfortunately. And then Satan will get in our ear, and he'll be like, look, look what your God did. A good God wouldn't let that happen, causing us to question. And it's like the little sister who makes a mess and then points at her brother saying, he did it, he did it. Unfortunately, I am no stranger to that scenario. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, remember, this is Satan's oldest trick in the book. This is exactly what he did to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. 
planting seeds of doubt of who God really is and his goodness. But when we can take a step back and make the decision to choose to not question God, remember, this is a choice, to choose to not question God and instead remember who he is. Remember the love he has for us. Remember the love he displayed to us when he died on the cross for us. Remember the times that he has supernaturally showed himself to you individually in your own life. When we can do this, instead of questioning him, this changes everything. And guys, I honestly, I have a lot more I want to say on this topic. There's so much to say, but I'm already over on time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the second and last application. Application number two is know he will use your suffering for good. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. It's producing something, something good. Psalm 119.71 says, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The author of the psalm looks back on the pain and suffering he's been through and he says, all this was actually good so that I might know the Lord my God better. He said it was good. And lastly, Genesis 50 verse 20, we all know this one. Joseph is speaking to his brothers and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Church family, there's no type of misery you will ever go through that God will not work for good. Or better said, by John Piper when he said so masterfully, not only is your affliction momentary, not only is your affliction light in comparison to eternity, eternity in the glory thereof, but all of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond of your pain from the fallen nature or fallen man, every millisecond of your misery on the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that whether it is cancer or criticism, whether it is slander or sickness, it wasn't meaningless. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your word. We praise you that you're so good that you won't let the ugly things that I'm sure all of us are thinking and pondering on right now, all these ugly things we've experienced, God, you are so good that you work them somehow for good for our good. I pray, Lord, that you would would help us to respond to this. I pray that we would have a deep knowledge and pursuit of, of just trusting in you. May we respond differently when pain comes. May we remember the words you promised us when pain comes. May we remember that there is nothing we will ever go through that you won't work for good. None of our pain is meaningless. We praise you for this truth, Lord, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Evan. We're so grateful for the word uh, that you brought today. Um, We'll sing our closing hymn as soon as Esther can mosey her way up here. But we're so grateful for you to bring in the word. It's always so hard when we go through trials to find the Lord. I hope that this word can help you as you seek him uh, during whatever trial you may be going through.